Okay, welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, I think people will continue to filter in, but I think it's time to start so that we can get the full hour. Uh, so in 2013, Stephen Klinsky from the class of 81 uh, and his wife Maureen Klinsky endowed the Stephen and Maureen Klinsky Professorship of Practice for Leadership and Progress. Uh, the first endowed professorship of practice at Harvard Law School. It brings visiting leaders from a wide range of fields beyond the law to our campus to teach, to inspire, and to broaden perspectives both at HLS and in the wider university. Um, His Eminence Timothy uh, Cardinal Dolan, the Archbishop of New York, delivered the first lecture under the auspices of the professorship, and previous holders of the Klinsky uh, professorship include Julius Janikowski, class of 91, the former chair of the FCC, uh, former Congresswoman Jane Harmon, class of 69, and Chris Kelly, class of 97, the first chief privacy officer, general counsel, and head of global public policy for Facebook. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Eric Lander, our Stephen and Maureen Klinsky Visiting Professor of Practice for Leadership and Progress this year. Um, This semester, he is teaching a reading group entitled Science and Law in the Federal Government, Issues and Challenges. Um, Dr. Lander is president and founding director of the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard, a geneticist, molecular biologist, and mathematician, He has played a pioneering role in the reading, understanding, and biomedical application of the human genome. He was also principal leader of the Human Genome Project. Uh, Dr. Lander is a professor of biology at MIT and a professor of systems biology at Harvard Medical School from 2009 to 2017. He served as co-chair of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology for President Obama. Dr. Lander's awards and honors are so numerous that uh, we are uh, going to um, uh, acknowledge that they are too numerous to read out uh, without cutting deeply into our question and answer time. Uh, And today we will hear from him about science and law, conversations we're not having. So without further delay, let's give an enthusiastic welcome to Dr. Eric Lander. Thank you very much, Dean Manning. It is uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, There we go. Let me start with the thanks. Uh, First to Stephen and Maureen Klinsky for endowing uh, this wonderful professorship of the practice. Uh, It's really wonderful to create a role for people who are completely unqualified to teach at the law school to come teach at the law school. But the requirement is it's for fields other than the law. And I I am absolutely tickled uh, to be doing this and to be here. And I'm teaching a a reading group. And uh, we've had five of our six meetings. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. But it has been tremendous to do that. I want to thank our former dean, Martha Minow, because uh, Martha corralled me one day in high rise on uh, Concord Ave and said, I, you know, we were both online and she turns around and she says, I was thinking about have you come teach at the law school? And I said, I accept. And so that's how this, that's how this arose and to Dean Manning uh, for having me here and uh, welcoming me, welcome me and uh, just, you know, all of, all of the warm uh, welcome I've received for everybody here at the law school. So, uh, I suppose that in addition to teaching the reading group, the purpose of giving the Klinsky lecture is to give some accounting of yourself. Like, who are you? Why are you here? And, and what, do you, what do you expect to be doing here? And so I will start with a very brief introduction to me. Um, I indeed have no formal connection to law, but we'll see in a moment. Uh, I come from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I went to Stuyvesant High School, was an undergraduate at Princeton, and then uh, did my PhD in pure mathematics at Oxford. Uh, Having decided not to do pure mathematics as a career, I somehow uh, talked my my way into teaching on the faculty of the Harvard Business School, where I taught managerial economics for a number of years. And having decided that managerial economics was, was not the 
uh, career I, I wished either in the business school being very tolerant if you taught your classes well. I used the time to also pick up molecular biology on street corners, this being a town with very good street corners for picking up molecular biology on. And so drifted into uh, molecular genetics over the course of the 1980s. Um, eventually uh, got an appointment at the Whitehead Institute in MIT where we built out what became the first of the centers under the Human Genome Project and during the 1990s worked on the Human Genome Project and I'm proud to say that you know, here in Cambridge uh, we made the leading contribution to that great international project. And after that was done and recognizing that a fantastic collaboration had grown up unofficially in the course of the Human Genome Project between Harvard and MIT and five teaching hospitals, uh, we somehow managed to create the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard devoted to genomic medicine. And it involves about 4,400 people across all of those different institutions in a variety of different ways. It's a semi-porous membrane with people coming in and out of it. And uh, it's, a, it's a really fun place. When you're in Kendall Square, it's right opposite Legals. Come stop in sometime. Um, now, I have no formal connection to law, but I have a deep interest and affection for law, um, in addition to uh, my parents having been lawyers, my wife having been a lawyer, and, uh, and, and all. I also have somehow stumbled into law on various occasions. In the late 1980s, I got involved with, in what turned out to be the first serious case in introducing DNA fingerprinting into uh, criminal courts in the United States, and not, not uh, coincidentally, the first case in which DNA fingerprinting was rejected as being unacceptably performed. It's a famous case. Uh, it's, it's the people of New York v. Castro, and um, it was a real great introduction to me for many things uh, about how science can play powerful roles in the legal system and how if powerful roles aren't held to high quality standards, they can do more harm than good. And so that's turned out well. DNA fingerprinting has turned out to be, after a whole bunch of hiccups, a very powerful and reliable tool in the courts. Uh, and in the course of that, some years later, I also joined the board of the Innocence Project, which emerged from that particular case. Uh, I also, from time to time, am known to write amicus briefs in Supreme Court cases, or at least two of them, and we'll touch on both of them here. Uh, but I, I enjoy you know, dipping in occasionally where it seems like science might have something useful to say. And then, as Dean Manning said, uh, probably my, my deepest involvement in all of these things, not law per se, but the touch on law, was my work for eight years together with about 20 some odd other amazing people, including John Holdren, who is here at Harvard and at the Kennedy School, on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, which is the sole advisory group, group to the President on all matters of science and technology that cut across agencies and cut across the federal government. And that was an amazing opportunity. We worked on 39 separate reports on a huge variety of topics. And I gotta say, what an education that was. And a fair amount of work while you have a day job. And everybody on this group had day jobs. But uh, everybody viewed it as a tremendous honor to be able to, to work on these things. And as is the case with scientists and technologists in producing 39 reports, and these are like real reports, uh, the group actually wrote every word. This was, none of this was given out to staff because scientists and technologists, like I assume you guys, you know, deeply believe that the words have to be exactly what we mean them to be. So um, that's, that's, I suppose, vaguely why Martha thought it would be fun to invite me to come do this. Uh, and what I've chosen to do with this reading group is essentially to talk about whatever I happen to be interested in, which, as Dean Manning acknowledged, is the best way to teach a course, because then you're passionate about whatever it is you're talking about. And so the subjects that we have or will cover were partisan gerrymandering. This case, Gill, that is before the Supreme Court right now, and Charles Freed came and joined me for that first class, and we, we talked about the case. Both Charles and I had written amicus briefs in that case, and uh, we have just 12 amazing students. I, I think based on the representation of the class, almost everybody at the Harvard Law School has deep backgrounds in science, technology, medicine, 
uh, you know, the, the average is about 25% of the people have or are getting an MD. You know, four people have experience as patent agents. I just salute you for, for this average across the, the whole law school as judged from that sample. Um, the second class was on forensic science and criminal courts. And as I've already said, that's a topic that's been of interest to me since the 1980s. Uh, and continued with a report that we wrote on PCAST on uh, forensic science in the criminal courts, which I'll talk about. The third uh, meeting, and, and for that one, uh, uh, Judge Gertner, Nancy Gertner, joined us for that course, and that was really fantastic. The third one was on gene patenting, this, this case before the Supreme Court in 2013 uh, on the patentability of the breast cancer gene which was a fascinating uh, case in which I also had written an amicus. And uh, we were joined that day by uh, Tanya Simoncelli, the woman who actually thought up the idea of challenging gene patents when she was a scientific advisor to the ACLU. Uh, just last, uh, sorry, in, in the beginning of March, we had a case on the regulation of hearing aids, a topic I won't talk about today, but it was PCAST's most effective report per page that you can imagine, maybe at all. Uh, it was an 11-page report that called for the creation of an over-the-counter class of basic hearing aids, uh, laid out what the issues were of how well-meaning ideas in the 1970s had turned into a small oligopoly that had made a, a pair of hearing aids cost 10 times more than an iPad. And it's tough, that's what they cost. And it's tough to imagine that the technology underlying a pair of hearing aids justifies that premium. And it's a very slow innovation cycle, et cetera. And we sort of pulled the thread on how regulation had affected all of those things and suggested that it would be medically safe to declare a certain class as over the counter, and we did. And remarkably, through the efforts of uh, Senator Warren, our own senator here, and Senator Grassley from, from uh, Iowa, it made it into law. And so this will, in fact, become the case uh, that we will have over-the-counter hearing aids. The FDA is instructed to be developing that class. Uh, I guess they now have another two and a half years to go, but it will make a huge difference. It should bring prices down from about $6,000 to... I'm guessing a couple hundred bucks or much less. So in any case, it was, it was interesting adventures, and we talked about the ups and downs of trying to get such a thing through. Last week, on Tuesday, we talked about artificial intelligence, including sentencing recommendations, and we'll talk about that a little bit today. And our last class next Tuesday, which we'll hold over at the Broad Institute, will be on genome editing and synthetic biology. And so we've covered a wide range of cases uh, looking at Supreme Court cases on the one hand and uh, looking at underlying scientific issues on the other. Um, looking at issues of fact and looking at issues of advocacy and looking at, at how science and law may come together. So that's what we've been up to, and I figured I had to give an accounting of that publicly somewhere, so that's now been done. But of course, in, in coming and saying I'm, I'm uh, willing to and, and excited about teaching, it has to be admitted for every teacher that the reason you teach is to learn as well. And uh, I saw this as a great opportunity to learn by engaging with 12 super smart students here and to engage with six really interesting topics and think afresh about them in a way that I wouldn't otherwise if I didn't have the responsibility of trying to teach a reading group. So. We're not done yet, and my thoughts haven't settled, but I do want to talk a little bit, both at the beginning, and then I'd like to return in a question and answer discussion, hopefully at the end, to the issue of the conversations we're not having between law and science. When scientists, because this is much on my mind, and you'll forgive me that the thoughts are still only partially formed, but I hope I'm going to provoke further conversation and maybe some some... Uh, venues where we really can talk about these things further. It's always said by everybody, oh, the law is so different than science because, you know, look, the processes the law uses, the adversarial process is so different than what goes on in, in, in science. Uh, you know, you get two people who take polar opposite opinions and they, they try to advocate for these two alternatives and somehow truth is supposed to emerge from that and scientists look at that and say, that's kind of crazy. In addition, the time frames on which the law operates, well, 
they need a resolution. You got to resolve stuff. You got to just keep churning out resolutions to disputes. And it's not critical that everyone be perfect, but it is critical that they get decided. Um, and scientists are very unhappy about that because as a matter of science, nothing is ever resolved. Indeed, the fundamental notion about science is that things remain open to challenge at all times. And we don't want to say this issue is completely settled. And certainly we're not going to get it settled within the length of a particular trial. But these sorts of things apply to any given case. They don't really apply to the broader question of the law. In many ways, when you go up to that level, the law is kind of similar to many ways we think about things in science because we truly try to grapple in science with fundamentals, with principles, with the meaning of things. And the law over long periods of time does try to do that. And while you can think about engaging between science and law at the level of an individual case, and a lot of that has to happen, and many people do it in patents and other things, it isn't the most interesting thing to me. To me, the most interesting thing is about those conversations that are extended conversations over time. And what I admire so much about American law is that we make these sweeping statements, all men are created equal. And then we take two centuries to figure out what did we mean by that? And we grow into the meanings of those words. I had occasion to talk to a German colleague whose mind was blown when he realized that we do that. And of course, you don't do that in continental law. You specify you know, what it is you mean. We actually go out there and we don't know what we mean and we come to understand it. All men are created equal. By men, we don't mean men. We mean everybody, it turns out eventually. Uh, by equal, what do we mean by equal and all those sort of things? Equal protection, due process. I think this is one of the most majestic things that, that we actually put out aspirations and we grow into them. And in science, we do it too. We want things to be right and reliable and we know we're imperfect and we're grappling for it. And I think at this level is the most interesting conversations that can happen between science and law where we recognize that we're both feeling around in the dark Things aren't going to be resolved quickly. And although in the courtroom it will be adversaries butting heads, in the real world it isn't adversaries butting heads. It is well-meaning people who bring different points of view to try to figure out some meaningful resolution. So I think the most productive conversations are not about complex details as in a patent case, although God knows very important, but about these simple ideas. But I do worry that we do not have effective forums for those conversations that scientists don't speak law, lawyers don't speak science, we don't have places to meet, and sadly, the place we mostly have to meet is in a courtroom, which just isn't such a great place to have these conversations. And so I wanna return later to, can we create these? And I think, since we have a dean here, I'm gonna say that, that the law school could turn out to be a marvelous place to experiment with forms for such conversations that might produce some useful products that might have some big impacts. So anyway, I'm going to grapple for just a, a little bit before we go to question and answers with some words. Reliable. What do we mean by reliable? That's something of interest to the law and to science. Extreme. What do we mean by something being extreme? A product of nature. The law has gotten itself into caring about that in the patent law, about products of nature, and about unbiased predictions. Because, of course, when a judge sentences someone or when a judge grants bail, they're making a prediction. We want these to be accurate, unbiased predictions. So these are places of fruitful conversation between law and science, and I'm going to touch on them because we've touched on these topics within the course. Um, I'll go lightly through them, not compared to the two hours that were devoted to each of these topics. And we didn't frame them in these ways. We framed them around particular cases and decisions and situations. But for now, I just want to deal with that. So this topic I've told you I care about, forensic science in the criminal courts, going back to DNA fingerprinting in the 1980s, this People uh, uh, v. Castro case. Um, what does it mean? to have a reliable method for telling whether two DNA samples match or two fingerprints match or two bullets came from the same gun or... Well, this reliable word is not my word, it's your word. 
It's the word of Rule 702 of the Federal Rules of Evidence. So Rule 702C says that for an expert to come to court and present testimony as an expert, one of the criteria is the testimony must be the product of reliable principles and methods. Uh, this comes from the Federal Rules of Evidence, first introduced in 1975, but the Daubert case ended up reshaping the meaning, and eventually these rules were restated a couple of times after Daubert, and this is the current form of, of 702C. And so they came out of initial rules. Uh, the Supreme Court made various comments about these things. They got reshaped in. But what we have right now is an instruction. The court, the judge, is to be a gatekeeper and let in only expert testimony that is based on reliable principles and methods. What in the world does that mean? I gotta say it's a mess. It's an extraordinary mess of what that means because it refers to all possible expert testimony and you can't talk about the reliability of everything. You can though talk about the reliability of particular broad areas. In any case, the court said in famous footnote nine in Daubert and in many other places in that decision, essentially, in a case involving scientific evidence, evidentiary reliability will be based on scientific validity. I can't think of a clearer instruction that says there must be a conversation between law and science. If evidentiary reliability is to be based on scientific validity, it can't just be a lawyer's opinion about scientific validity, it has to be scientific validity. And this compels the conversation. So we, in the form of, of the scientific community, the National Academy of Sciences and PCAST, in, in two reports that I've referenced here, the National Academy in 2009 and PCAST in 2016, have been grappling with the meaning of reliability for just one broad class of evidence, but an important one in forensic science. Forensic feature comparison methods. This is the stuff you see in CSI. DNA samples, when they say, it's a match. Or latent fingerprints, it's a match. Or the firearms or bite marks, when they say, despite having no evidence to support it, it's a match, that person bit that person. Footwear analysis, this print must have come from that shoe or hair analysis, this hair has to have come from the defendant. The methods all are essentially similar in their structure. There's a laboratory component. You get two samples. You have a set of features you're supposed to look at, the width of the hair, the shape of the hair, the, the roughness of the hair, the color of the hair. Same for DNA. For whatever. You, you look at these features and you ask, do they agree within a certain tolerance with respect to those features? If so, is that surprising? Would you expect things that came from different sources to agree? Notice you can't answer the question until you do both. It's fine to say they agree on height, but I mean, big deal. There are a lot of people who agree with you on height. That's not enough. We need a database to understand how frequently there are people of your height. I, you know, so those, those are the two key things you've got to have. So what does it mean for a method like this to be reliable? How do we know that it gets you a reliable answer when you declare that two things are likely to have come from the same source? Well, before I get there, why does it matter? Who cares if they're really reliable? Well, I mean, obviously, Rule 702 tells us, tells us we're supposed to care if they're reliable, and of course, you know, we respect Rule 702, but outside of the fact that the federal rules of evidence compel us to pay attention to that, there are a lot of good reasons to care particularly about forensic feature comparison methods being reliable. First of all, they were not developed in any scientific laboratory, with the exception of DNA. They were developed as very rough heuristics to guide an investigation. They are not grounded in the validation practices of science. And of course, for the purpose of investigation, you can use a Ouija board. The federal rules of evidence do not speak to how you investigate. You can use any intuition you want to do that, perhaps. This refers to, though, when we bring it to court, is it valid? Well, so they were not developed through any normal procedures of scientific validation. They were developed by well-meaning constabularies around the world, often in the 1800s, 1900s. Uh, in addition, 
they are particularly concerning because they claim to be and are seen to be tremendously probative. That they claim often to be able to discriminate to a level of one in a million. And not only that, when you ask mock jurors, they say, oh yeah, that's probably one in a million when you say it matches. If you don't give them a number, they'll fill in that number. That seems to be the notion out there, is that these things are highly, highly discriminative, able to discriminate. Uh, they were accepted by courts early and middle of the 20th century before there's any well-developed notion, and before, by the way, there was a Rule 702 that said this. And so we, we have a long history of acceptance of methods without underlying evidence. They are particularly concerning as compared to many other things an expert might talk about because a lay juror has no chance of understanding what most of these things are about. So this is entirely going to be people coming in garbed in, in the robes of science. And then special compared to most other things, we know they get it wrong because we now know there have been 350 wrongful convictions when it's not a question of somebody was later uh, released or a conviction was overturned, it was agreed the person was actually innocent, that they had the wrong person. And that's, of course, what DNA fingerprinting did for us, was it allowed us to say, wrong person. Um, so we can actually find false positives in the legal system. And so when something is seen as extremely probative and gets it wrong and hasn't been validated, there's a special reason to attend to it. And that's why rather than taking on the meaning of reliability for all of science, which I think is a, is a, is a mistake to try to go so broadly, we took on this one area. So um, the National Academy wrote a report in 2009. Judge Edwards from the, uh, from the DC Circuit co-chaired that report. Uh, and it focused on all the ways in which this could be improved, improvements uh, for forensic science. It had no effect, no effect. It was so curious, Judge Edwards, a distinguished jurist, basically approached this, and his committee approached it, as scientists. And they said, look, here are the defects, here's how it could be improved, et cetera. But what ended up happening was there was an immune reaction by the Department of Justice and by the aspects of, of the legal system that said, that's great, improvement. We all want improvement. Improvement is incremental. We should keep improving. But this has nothing to do with admissibility. This really doesn't bear on what comes into court. And therefore, please feel free to keep improving. We, we support that. But there were strong statements that this really had no impact on admissibility. And yet, of course, admissibility is the thing people pay attention to. Because if it's not admissible, then you got to start paying attention. If you can get it in, you know, you're down to your particular courtroom and your particular jury. So when PCAS took up this question at the behest of the president, uh, you know, he said, we've we started a National Commission on Forensic Science, we've done some other things, et cetera. What else could we be doing, the president asked. We decided to focus very squarely on the question of admissibility because we figured nothing else really mattered. And so we deliberately wrote a report, it's about 177 pages, 300 footnotes, it's quite a report, but it focuses on one basic question. What does it mean for something to be reliable if it's a forensic uh, feature comparison method? Uh, and then we actually took our definition and we tried it out on a whole bunch of fields and asked, how are they doing, those fields? So here is the radical conclusion. And I say that not in jest, because this is a conclusion that most people at the Department of Justice will disagree with. Our radical conclusion. A forensic feature comparison method can only be considered reliable if its accuracy has been empirically tested. Pretty much it. It's a radical statement that empiricism is necessary. If you don't have empirical evidence that, that measures the accuracy under reasonable conditions and the accurately, accuracy is reasonably usable, you don't have to fuss too much about it, you don't have a method, you have no business in court. This turns out to be a flashpoint. It is stunning that this is a flashpoint, but it is. I'll explain why. But first, let me tell you about the history of these methods. History of feature comparison methods. They go through certain stages. I won't say stages of denial, but in any case, they go through stages here. The first might be called data-free theories. The second, spurious estimates. 
Then you get to empirical tests, often tiny empirical tests, and then finally meaningful empirical tests. So I'll just take fingerprints. In 1984, the Justice Department issued a formal document that declared, it was like papal in its, in its nature, it declared fingerprints to be the only method that, that were both feasible and infallible. And so it's a remarkable statement. In 2016, the Department of Justice did disavow this statement as, as overreaching. But as recently as 2009, the former head of the crime lab, uh, FBI crime lab, did testify in a case that, here's a spurious estimate, that fingerprints were accurate to at least one part in 11 million. How did that estimate arise? Because during the time he had been there, they had done 11 million fingerprint comparisons, and he was only aware of one error. <laughs> and so... But this was testimony in a case. It was, it was remarkable. And then, God bless him, the FDI, FBI did the right thing. The FBI crime laboratory is filled with some very good scientists, and they did what's called the black box study. You don't know what's in the examiner's head. You have to treat it as a black box. Give them problems. See how often they get the right answer. They found they make a mistake about one time every 600. You know, with error bars, maybe one in 300. It's not infallibility. It's not one in 11 million, but it's not bad. You can go to court and say, they get it wrong about one time in 600. And you suddenly can weigh that against other evidence. And we don't have to worry about it precisely what that is. I believe now that fingerprints can be considered to a first order, having some statement of reliability. And it didn't kill them to measure the accuracy. Firearms. Well, they're, they were funny, spurious estimates where they gave people bags of bullets. And they, they knew they were related in various ways. And they got them right about with an error rate of only one in 5,000. But there were a lot of internal hints when you thought about it. As soon as more recently started by the Department of Defense, people began comparing things where you didn't have those internal hints. They make mistakes about one time in 50. All right, that's a number. That's reliability. Uh, let's take bite marks. The famous paper in 1984 on bite marks looked at all the teeth you have and that they could be at different angles and different things and calculated no mouths, actu no bites actually made, calculated that there could be six trillion different hypothetical patterns that, bite, that, that, that dentitions could make. And therefore, dentition was unique, and there were one in six trillion patterns, and therefore bite marks you know, were an identifying feature. But nobody actually tested, even if it were true that, that, were, that, that mouths were also different, whether mouths biting into flesh and then blood oozing and, and, and swelling, whether you could tell anything, until relatively recently when studies were done that found that they can't. They really do abysmally. Even when there are only four biters and you have to associate with one of the four, you get it wrong one time in six. That is an empirical test, but it's a test that says it's useless. And onward, footwear is really great. There's one that calculates the chance that three random dings would be in particular places and estimates it at one in 683 billion. And as of today, there is yet to be a single test whatsoever of empirical evidence of whether they can do it or not. So anyway, this all seems radical. Uh, it's all, sorry, this all seems obvious. And you know, so we said nothing can substitute for empirical evidence. This is sort of stuff from the 1600s, the idea of empirical evidence or so. But it is broadly contended, including by the Department of Justice, that things can substitute. It's okay, it's, it's okay if the method is based on science. That's like the screenplay is based on a true story. <laughs> Examiners have good professional practices, training, certification, accreditation, professional organizations, best practices manuals. This is stuff the Supreme Court recognizes in Daubert as good indicia. The problem is psychics have all of these. <laughs> psychics have accreditation. They have organizations. They have proficiency tests. They have peer-reviewed journals. What is the difference between psychics and science? Empirical tests. That's the only difference. And so all of these things are nice to have, but irrelevant with regard to reliability should count for nothing because we know that psychics do this. You can put all these things in without being right. So in any case, we've argued this, and we go back and forth all the time. We made a set of recommendations um, to the Justice Department, to the FBI, to NIST, to OSTP. The Justice Department rejected all the recommendations. 
NIST was much more accommodating, others were accommodating. The Trump administration went further and abolished the National Commission on Forensic <laughs> Science and appointed one guy, a prosecutor at the Department of Justice, to serve as the advisor on forensic science because he had been on the aforesaid abolished commission. Um, and so we made one recommendation, though, to, ju to the judiciary, which was the judges should take into account these, these criteria, the scientific criteria, and the judges should ensure that testimony is consistent with the empirical evidence, and that the, ju the Judicial Conference of the United States, through its standing committee, the Standing Advisory Committee on the Federal Rules of Evidence should prepare a best practices manual and perhaps an advisory, new advisory committee note about 702. And God bless them, they listened. Last October, the uh, Advisory Committee on Evidence held a one-day symposium here in Boston where they brought together 22 people and they brought together the committee to hear talks on how Rule 702 might be revised in principle. They haven't promised to revise it, but they wanted to understand what were the problems, what might we need to do. And that big fat volume appeared this week. I just got this in my office. This is the transcript of that together with articles written by many of the participants, myself included, on how one might fix Rule 702. And so the legal system is actually responding very slowly. I'm not holding my breath. I don't expect to change, but people are beginning to pay attention. And it's an interesting thing that they're grappling with the fact that Rule 702 doesn't really work in this way. What are some of the problems? We don't have a good channel for conversation. Courts don't and can't take, in some people's views, judicial notice of a number of scientific authorities. Various courts have said, well, we can't admit this National Research Council, National Academy report. Uh, at least we've got to go witness every single time you want to get it in. The PCAST report, you know, the Ju Department of Justice complained bitterly about the report because it had the seal, the president, on the cover of the report. And they said, people might think this is a report from the White House. And we said, this is a report from the White House. <laughs> and so, so there you go. Um, and so, but whether it comes in or not, it depends on the judge and all that. And I get phone calls all the time. Would I come to Montana to testify on the PCAST report? And I can't do that. And they're like, not that many people on the committee. We couldn't possibly cover this. So we don't have ways for courts naturally to take this in. Um, we don't have a great way for the scientific authorities in this country, like the leading advisory group to the legislature, the National Academy of Sciences, and the leading advisory group to the White House, to even have a, a, a channel of conversation to say this should be taken, um, you should take judicial notice of these things. But in addition, it's, it's a little worse than that because Evidentiary decisions, including these about, about expert testimony, are, are reviewed under the abuse of discretion standard. So it means the two utterly contradictory decisions about a technology are both fine as long as a reasonable judge could have reached either. And since we have no overarching conversation about it, it's not hard to reach that conclusion. So the usual forces that would, that would engender convergence do not occur. But I note that this week also, See, the great thing about giving a talk is all sorts of things happen the week you're giving a talk. I learned that the Royal Society in the United Kingdom has begun writing little manuals. 35-page friendly, you can't read it, but you know, just friendly white space manuals directed to the courts, primers for the courts on topics like forensic gait analysis. Can you tell from a, a video of somebody walking whether that was you or you? And they do a careful analysis and they say, there are no black box studies. Oh, be still my heart. They followed the whole PCAST framework. It was wonderful. There are no black box studies. Yes, gait might be completely unique if you could measure it perfectly, but there's no evidence anybody measures it perfectly enough. The only empirical study that's been done got it wrong like one time in four with a limited set of people. And it laid it out in such simple, clear terms. They're doing one for DNA makes me think, and I'll return to the question, how can we do such things here to lay things out in, in language that communicates this? So anyway, I'm going to touch on a couple other topics before I want to throw it open to everybody. And uh, I'll just touch, but here I'll touch more lightly. Electoral maps, same question. What does the word excessive mean? when we talk about excessive partisan gerrymandering. In our course, I handed this picture, I handed that picture out on our first meeting. That is the famous Pennsylvania 7th, affectionately known as Goofy Kicking Donald Duck. And, and uh, 
it was the district when we started the course, and again, through superb planning, we had the Pennsylvania Supreme Court declare uh, Pennsylvania's map to be an unconstitutional gerrymander based only on the state constitution, not reviewable by the Supreme Court, and uh, a new map has been issued, and goofy kicking Donald Duck is no longer in force. But in any case, the timing could not have been better for the course. But the key thing, and I'll just go quickly through this, is the Supreme Court has grappled with the following question. Excessive partisan gerrymandering is a problem. It's incompatible with democratic principles, and everybody agrees it is unconstitutional. But it may not be justiciable, because there may not be a judicially manageable standard for recognizing one, and that has been the big issue before the court. Not that it's okay, not even that it's constitutional, but that there may not be a judicially manageable standard. But in the most recent case in 2004, Justice Kennedy, the swing vote in this whole business, wrote, technology is both a threat and a promise, saying that the same technologies that are allowing us to make more and more excessive gerrymanders might be a microscope to let us recognize excessive gerrymanders. And so we debated this a lot in the class, and here, who knows what will happen in Gil v. Whitford, I don't know, but what I wrote in an amicus brief was that excessiveness is an inherently quantitative concept that requires at least some quantitative underpinning. You can't hope to talk about whether something is an excessive gerrymander without some quantitative grounding. So how do you, you, know, how do you focus on this? Well, the legal literature, some cases including, uh, some, some articles including one about something called the efficiency gap, have focused on defining various metrics of partisanship. But defining a measure doesn't end the story. Is that measure excessive? The only way you can tell if a measure is excessive if you know the answer, excessive compared to what? Well, we do this all the time in laboratories. So we measure something, we say, does it fit our model? Does it have a p-value? Is it far out on the tail of the distribution? Or is it within what we might expect? And do we reject some hypothesis? The natural question to be asked how does the state's chosen map compare in its partisanship to all other maps it could have drawn consistent with its declared principles? That's it. Excessiveness should mean far out on that distribution of all possible maps you could have drawn. And so I argued in this particular amicus that that was a perfectly easy thing to compute, or at least doable thing to compute. It was sort of like the way we compute whether a, a nuclear bomb will blow up. We look at a distribution of outcomes or a nuclear power plant won't blow up, or a hurricane will hit Miami. The federal government does this all the time, of look at a distribution of outcomes and see which ones have a particular property, how far out is things on a distribution. If something's an extreme outlier, the argument that this was plausibly explained by the state's goals don't, don't hold water. So that's a way to do it. I believe that we need to have, whatever the court does, I hope they keep the door open to this question of excessive partisan gerrymandering and we get to further flesh out what this can mean. But there's got to be a conversation between folks in science who think naturally about how do we know whether something is extreme and know that you can actually run large-scale computer calculations to know the answer. There's no guessing, there's no mushy, you, you draw all possible maps, or at least sample from the distribution of all possible maps. There's a fertile conversation for us to have. Gene patenting, similar sort of questions arose in this case. I won't go into much detail other than to say, after a surprising victory by the ACLU at the federal district level, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit that hears patent appeals ruled that genes were patentable because while your chromosomes were products of nature, fragments of the DNA of a chromosome did not occur in nature and therefore were the work of man. Um, this is stated in the opinion of the court because fragments do not occur in nature, da, 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 no citation. So it turns out there's 40 years of literature showing that fragments of DNA occur, and not only that, prenatal testing for Down syndrome in moms is often now done by taking blood from maternal circulation to find the fragments of fetal DNA that are circulating there. So this is not actually a, a, like a hypothetical question. It's the basis of Down syndrome testing that there are fragments circulating in maternal circulation, and yet it made it all the way through the federal circuit without anybody saying, whoa, wait a second, that actually isn't actually true. 
remarkably, uh, I wrote an amicus in this and some, some other folks did, remarkably the Supreme Court ruled nine nothing in favor, uh, in favor of, of the uh, plaintiffs in this case, arguing that genes were indeed patents, uh, products of nature and could not be patented. Um, and it was, it's a fascinating situation. It's, uh, we, we spent a long time in our class talking about that decision, which is a confused decision that we reached, in my opinion, the right result, but very confusingly, and good luck trying to understand. There's only one critical paragraph in the opinion by Justice Thomas, and that one paragraph will not help you a great deal. So where it goes, who knows, but there's still gonna be more such conversation. Finally, last topic, artificial intelligence. Unbiased prediction. Well, you may be aware, and when I walked into Dean Manning's office at 11.45 today, it was the first question he asked me about the use of machine systems to try to improve the decisions we make in court about who should get bail or what the sentence should be because of chance of recidivism on the part of, of someone who's been convicted. And there's this cool system called Compass that is used in a number of states where based on 21 variables that somebody fills out, the, 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 the individual, the, the, the defendant now convicted, fills out these 21 variables, the computer churns and it says you get a risk score of reoffending between one and 10. And this offers great possibilities. We know judges are imperfect. We know there are biases in the heads of judges. We know that they behave differently after lunch and before lunch. We know judges, you know, why shouldn't it just be done by a machine and get it right and get all of this subjectivity out of it? Well, one reason ProPublica found was that the algorithms are only as good as the stuff you pour into them. And it turned out that if you have African-American individuals who it turns out don't commit a crime in the next two years, and white individuals, who it turns out don't commit a crime in the next two years, and you compare the scores they were assigned by the algorithm, the African-American individuals get much higher risk scores, despite the fact that those are between two populations that do not reoffend. So in fact, the average is about right, but the errors are distributed highly unequally across groups, included here, including your protected groups. Well, that's a little worrisome. How did it do that? Well, we have no idea because the code is proprietary. Um, and the argument is you can't see the code because the state bought the code and the state signed the contract that said it's the intellectual property of the company. And that might, just might cause issues with equal protection, due process, all who knows, all sorts of things there. I gotta say, I admire tremendously the work of a bunch of faculty here at the law school and MIT who wrote an open letter to the legislature that is considering adopting risk assessment for Massachusetts saying, if you're gonna do it, all sorts of measures have to be in place. And I think it's a great model for the sort of things we could be doing and turning it more into just an open letter on Medium to some series of reports about if you're gonna do it, here are the measures to know. You gotta keep checking every couple of years because it could be drifting. You gotta do this, you gotta do that. And we could set standards for these things early. And then, oh, that was just 21 variables. 21 variables is easy. Um, what we now are facing is a world of deep learning where millions of variables go in about millions of things. As I put to my law school class, when you get hired at a law, when they're considering you for hiring at a law firm, they scrape all of your social media records. They scrape everything, toss it into the big neural net and find out whether they should hire you or not. Who knows what the neural net is doing? Nobody knows. It's a million coefficients in there. In what sense can we speak of intent? Now, they will agree, we will make sure not to put in your race or your gender or other things. But of course, with all those data, it's not very hard for those things to be represented anyway. No matter how you try to take them out, they're there. We can learn all those things. We can predict your gender. We can predict your race. So in no sense can we take them out. And we can't tell what the machine is doing. How are we gonna decide if these are unbiased predictors? We actually need guidance here. And happily, we haven't gone too far that we can't still predict try to develop such guidance. So I'm gonna stop because I wanna have at least 10 minutes of discussion here. We are not having the conversations we could have, but there is no better place than Boston to have them. Harvard particularly is a place that is rich in law, rich in the humanities, rich in the sciences and technologies, and MIT just down the road has tremendous assets to bring to bear as well. 
The thing the UK is doing, fantastic. We could be doing stuff like that, and we could draw, draw the national academies into it. We could be doing things like that, like Chris Bavitz's letter to the, to the legislature. If we choose things about principle, where each side can inform about principles, I think we could provide a lot of guidance that isn't quite so hard, it isn't in the weeds, and it could be tremendously influential. So how do we create more effective forms for the conversation between law and science? There's no better time than just right now, starting our third century here, to think about how to do it, because I suspect this third century will be filled with many, many such questions. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here and to teach. Don't be shy. Okay. When you use the empirically tested results where one in six is an error, where one in six is an error, or one in six hundred is an error, is there a line somewhere where you say one in six is not admissible, one in sixty or six hundred is admissible, or you're allowed to tell them how accurate it is? I'm one in six. So the same issue rose in German. We talk about how far out on the distribution is it? a lively topic in our classes. How far out of the tail does it have to be? Where's the sharp line? So Reverend Baker B. Carr, the initial decision, didn't say how unequal districts could be in the electoral map. It said one person would vote. But of course, we knew it was never going to be down to the last decimal. And over time, somehow the Supreme Court worked its way to the fact that 1% was the limit for congressional districts, but 10% was OK for state districts. Mm -hmm. In some sense, it doesn't matter exactly where the line gets drawn or who's involved. What matters is that we measure it, we pay attention to it. So I don't want to hang up on where to draw the line. I want to insist that those data have to be collected before you can come in, and that the courts will somehow digest and metabolize where to draw lines in those cases. But this has been a lively discussion throughout our course. Yes? There's a troubling tension between the tension between the optimism of your first substantive slide and the fruits of many of your examples. So the first substantive slide, as I remember, said something like, oh, there we are. Uh, no. It said, uh, the law and science are really pursuing the same thing. Or at least... Well, I said it's similar. Yeah. They're not pursuing the same thing, but yeah. See if you agree. Yep. <coughs> fruits of many of the particular examples reinforce our common sense in the law. But there are distressingly few participants in the process who are um, primarily focused on either truth or justice. Yep. So lawyers are definitely not. Their obligation is to represent as enthusiastic and effectively their clients as possible within some limits set by the county's methods. Legislators rarely are, mm -hmm. as they are moved by various incentives of people who are seeking their support. Judges self-consciously found their um, zones of discretion by what they believe the law to permit. So whereas the contrast to the community of scientists largely are pursuing truth, um, evidence-based inquiry is the dominant orientation. Sadly, outside of an optimistic interpretation of law schools, there are relatively few players in the legal system that have that in mind. In the small, yes. That's why I write in the small, I total agree. Within any given courtroom, this does not apply. But somehow, we manage still to, to extend certain meanings, grow into certain meanings. And it's not because any one legislator is not conflicted by a whole lot of things, including getting reelected. But for reasons I don't fully understand, and I realize there's no theorem that it will be the case, as a, as a society, we somehow manage to have these conversations, but they take decades. And this is long the somehow? What, what is it that in that somehow? Well, you know, it, it's do you believe that the, the, the arc of justice, the, the, the arc of the universe is long, but bends to just toward justice? You know, at least you read American history long enough. I'd say we, we bent more than you might have thought at the beginning. It's not, it's not fantastic. <coughs> but there's progress that gets made. And when I talk about these issues, 
tilting at, at the forensic science issue since 1989, and it made real progress. DNA is now pretty, pretty rigorous when it was crap when we started. We have now have forced the FBI to do a black box study on fingerprints. They're now ginning up black box studies on, on firearms. We're going to see it. It will take decades to get there, and it will take forever if we don't do this. So I'm not Pollyanna that this is all easy and that any of this stuff is going to happen quickly, which is why it is a conversation to be had outside the courtroom, because it won't get done in the courtroom. And if I'm a little over-optimistic, so be it, because it's the only way to get anything done. But I, I've beat my head against enough of these not to be too over-optimistic, and I've done battle with the Department of Justice on these questions, who really will tell you privately, as they do say privately, look, if you could grant us dispensation for five years, that it didn't apply to anything until five years we could clean this up, and right now, we don't, want to, we don't want to overturn past convictions, we don't want to serve cases that are ongoing, couldn't we just do this? And they asked us that. And we said, we did not have authority to say that these statements of science only come into effect five years ago. <laughs> but I know that we would have had a better negotiation if we could, yes. So, uh, this is terrific. Uh, the best seminar I ever taught was maybe 20 years ago when I had law students and medical students in the same room trying to understand what's going on in this broad way. And I guess the thing that came through to me the most was building a little bit on Terry Fisher's last point, was the cultural difference in the way in which people yep. thought about these issues. Uh, and so I guess it's a kind of a two-part question. One is, it's hard to separate the small from the big because the culture of the small dominates the way in which people mm -hmm. think about the big. Uh, I guess the, the, the part I'd really love you to say about, which you didn't say much about in your talk, is how can the culture of law, or how should the culture of law affect the culture of science? That is, you said a lot about how the culture of science should affect the culture of law, most of which I agree with, somebody who does empirical research, but you haven't said much about how the culture of law might affect the culture of science in this discussion. Mm. And you would be great to talk about that. Well, given that we have very short time, I'll only give a very short answer. I don't know how the culture of but I do think the questions we grapple with in law should and can. Science comes along to things. Agriculture, in the end of the 1800s, was the origin of statistics. If you read a statistics book today, and it's been dehydrated of any application to, to agriculture, it sounds like just math stuff, but no, it came from a desire to do agriculture. Many things will provoke these questions about what is a fair prediction, for example, uh, these questions, even about what's an excessive gerrymander, I swept under the rug that those are pushing all sorts of developments in computer science to truly be able to do those calculations properly. I believe the questions that will arise in law will shape the focus of some people in science and to the group. I know that the rule is we stop at one. I'm going to turn back over to the dean, and thank you all very much. Thank you.